I've been finding out more about stiff shapes. Now, it's surprising, isn't it, that thin, flat materials can be made much stronger just by the way you shape them. Layering, like plywood, putting a crease or a fold in them, like a metal shelf, or making arches, like corrugated paper. Now, it's because materials can be strengthened like this that many of the objects that we see around us today are the shape they are, like this plastic bucket. It's made of thin plastics material, not all that stiff in itself. Inside, I've got one which I've cut in half, so you can see the shape much better. The rim of the bucket is rounded, it's arch-shaped. That strengthens the rim and helps the bucket keep its shape, especially when it's full of water. You could have a thick, solid rim instead of an arch shape. That would use more material and be a waste, as well as making the bucket more expensive. And here, the rim is reinforced with struts like these to support the handle. And have a look at the handle. Cut through, it's a capital I shape, a very strong shape. And again, not wasting material. A lot of thought goes into the making of shapes like these. The material itself isn't all that stiff. It's the shapes that give the strength. Malcolm's been finding out how things like these are made. Where are you today, Malcolm? Well, I'm at a plastics factory near Felsham, David. And here they make all kinds of things out of plastic material. Here. Well, these plastics feel stiffer than the plastics used for the buckets. But it's also still warm from the mould. Now, let's have a look inside and see some of the special shapes that help give it extra support and strength. Inside here, where the screen will go, the corners are supported by these arch shapes. It's called a web. And the arch shape also supports the seating where a bolt will go later. Inside this circle, for the speaker, there's a raised rim, like the lip of the bucket, and it's there for extra strength. And here are five struts to give extra support to the front of the cabinet. So now let's look at the outside. Curved corners are stronger than square ones. And these corrugations help make this whole thing stronger and stiffer, just like corrugated cardboard. Now, things like the television cabinet are made from polystyrene granules. See? Little pellets. And they're fed up through the hose, into the hopper, and down into the machine. The granules are fed into the barrel of the moulding machine. It's very hot, and inside the granules melt down. A screw forces the hot molten mass forward through a small gate. The plastic is injected into the mould. Here, molten plastic is being shot out to test the machine. Now the jaws or plattens of the mould close and molten plastic is being injected into the mould until it's absolutely full. Once there, it's rapidly cooled until it sets firmly. The jaws or plattens of the moulding machine open and the finished cabinet is pushed out. It's the mould that decides the shape. The mould is the most important part. Well, let's have a look at a mould. It's in two halves. It's made of steel and it's very heavy. It's cooled by water pipes inside. And when the two halves come together like jaws, there's a space left. Well, that's where the plastics materials are injected through this hole and along these runners to the sides of the mold. A 
of course, the plastic's set hard in these runners and has to be removed, as we saw, while the plastic is still warm. And now David has an even bigger moulding to show you that was made in a factory just like this one. And here it is, a plastic sailing dinghy. The hull section and the deck section. The hull is moulded all in one piece, so is the deck. It's over three metres long, uh, the longest ever made. Let's have a closer look at the rim on the deck section. It's a double L shape. And it goes all the way around. And here is where that double L shape of the deck section fits when it's welded together. Beverly, can you give me a hand? Of course, David. It's a bit floppy. Yeah. All right. That's it. Thank you. Now, can you see the shape of the cockpit area? It has rounded corners, arch shapes, which are very strong. And the floor of the cockpit is corrugated, which make it stiff and strong. And here's another strong shape. It's the mast, and it's a hollow tube. There's something special about a mast. It has to bend in high winds. And this is able to because it is a hollow tube. If it was solid, it would probably snap. There are lots of hollow tubes in nature too. This is canary grass. It's stiff, but it's also flexible enough not to break in the wind. That's because its stem is hollow. Here it is cut across. Look closer. The wall of the tube is made up of hundreds of tiny tubes. Here's another hollow stem plant. It's the stem of a teasel. If you look closely enough, you can see the ribs along the stem that give it extra strength. Here it is cut across. Now, not all hollow tubes are flexible. Sometimes you need a rigid tube. This is a human thigh bone. If we cut it in half, it looks like this, a hollow tube. Bones are rigid. Imagine what it would be like if our bones were flexible and bendy. And it's quite heavy. Now look at this bone. It's very much lighter. That's because it's a bird's bone. It's the thigh bone of a vulture. The walls are much thinner and inside, there are all these struts that help to make the bone even stronger. A tube is hollow, very rigid, very light. Tubes can be very strong. I'm using tubes to build this framework. They're very light, made of a thin plastics material. And they're held together with these special joining up bits here. That's it. And with a little help from my friends, we've got a bridge. Up we come, Bev. Good, isn't it? Yeah. Well. This beautiful model helicopter. It's very strong, very rigid, but most important, because it has to fly, it's very light. Now, this has been made by someone who makes models for the James Bond films. He's our studio guest today. It's Dave Neiman. Hello, Dave. Hello, Dave. Now, how do you make something as strong as this and yet light enough to fly? I'll show you. We start with something like this, which is called a plug. It's carved from solid wood or plaster. Mm -hmm. And we reproduce the shape we want in solid form. That's well, pretty heavy, isn't it? It is, yes. Obviously, that won't fly. No. But from this, we make a mould, which is this here. Let's see, and that fits around there. It's two halves, isn't it? Yes. I can see it, yeah. We make it in two halves, join it together. And what's the next stage? And from that, we get this, which 
as the finished helicopter body. Well, that's very light, isn't it? It is. Hmm? And this, with all the, all the parts, the, with the, the razor blades and the tail, that becomes, becomes a this, helicopter. which is a flying model. Well, let us into the secret, Dave. What's the material that you use? I'll show it you. Well, you make it from this. Yes, this is glass fibre mat. Well, that doesn't look very, very strong. It's certainly not rigid, is it? No. You can tear it. Huh? Well, we impregnate it with a resin, which, when cured, gives this result. I see, yes. You can see the fibres there, can't you, in the resin? Yes. Well, how do you make shapes? Well, how again, again, we use a mould, and using the resin, we lay the mat into the mould, and apply the resin until it's saturated. As you see, it conforms to the shape of the mould once the resin is in there. Mm-hmm. And then what happens? Well, we let that dry, and once it's dry, we trim the excess off. We do the same in the other half of the mould, join it together, and from the mould, once it's dry, we get that, which is the tail end of a helicopter. Which is very light. Right, you can see the glass fibres there, can't you? Yes. And the curves, which give it strength, the arches. And of course the whole thing is a tube, isn't it, which is a strong shape too. Yes, very rigid. So then, glass fibre is an ideal material for making flying models. Yes, for our purposes it's perfect. Well, can we have a demonstration of a chopper flying? Yes, certainly. Think about it. A sleeve's a tube. My skirt's a tube. Thank goodness it isn't stiff or I couldn't sit down. But in years gone by, clothes were stiff. What do you think of this? Isn't it stunning? Can you see how the collar frames the head? It's made of a fine net fabric with a lace edging. This is the fabric. It's not stiff at all. For the collar, the fabric was stretched over a wire frame to make it stand up. Can you see the wires? Now here's a ruff made of lace. The lace is stiffened with a kind of gum and it dries hard like resin. It makes the lace very stiff indeed. The sleeves stand out stiffly too, not by themselves. Inside, it's padded. Now, no matter how thick and heavy the material, it couldn't stand up by itself like this. The lady wore a farthingale. This farthingale is made of four cane hoops. Can you see the cane? And it's supported by wooden struts. It's suspended from the waist like this. And it's the farthingale that gives the dress its shape. This Victorian lady's dress also needed something to give it this bell-like shape. A crinoline. It's made of 10 or 12 steel hoops. Imagine trying to get into a car wearing one of these. Fifty years after this fashion, there came something to take your breath away. It's true, I can hardly breathe. To get this wasp-waisted look, women had to wear these. It's a whalebone corset. It's made of whalebone and they're slotted into the corset here. Here's whalebone. It's stiff, and it also gives a little. A good thing too, or I couldn't even bend. Beverly, may I have the pleasure of this next dance? Of course, David. Thank you. 
You do look rather smart. Do you think so? Yes. Well, it's looking rather dapper. That mm. shirt front, is it starched? Yeah, that's a... Like a suit of armour. It is. A collar. That's very uncomfortable, mind you. But it frames the bow tie. Hmm? Mm. Very stiffly starched. And the cuffs. Actually, so stiff, you could actually write notes to yourself on those. Really? Hmm. Should we continue dancing? You're looking thinner than usual, David. Um, Did men wear corsets in those days? That's a question you're not supposed to ask a gentleman. <laughs> Malcolm, what are you going at? Uh, Malcolm, you do look smart. Oh, this is the army officer's evening dress. Actually, it's the mess kit of an officer in the Cheshire Regiment. Now, a lot of skill goes into making a suit like this, so uh, I'll show you how it's done, shall I? Well, here's a jacket like mine, but it's not quite finished. Now, this material is quite soft, so let's see how the tailor gets the shape into it. Now, this stand-up collar is quite stiff. Now, this material is made of buckram. Now, this is buckram. As you can see, it's a very stiff material indeed. Now, can you see inside here this sort of canvas lining right at the bottom? Now, this is made of horsehair. And again, that's a very stiff material. Now, the shape is put in with this cotton wadding inside here. And all of these things are stitched across and across to bring this shape into the tunic. So the, the curve remains smooth. Now, these suits, of course, are made for the wearer. They're made for life. They have to fit, and they're very comfortable indeed. Thank you, Malcolm. Goodbye. See you next week. Goodbye.